Welcome to the Books to Business podcast. Terry, take them home. This is a 70 plus year old book, uh, Man Search for Meaning, Victor Frankel. This um, was a deep book. Huge book. And the timing couldn't be better, in my opinion. Um, this is about uh, a, psychi- a psychiatrist that was, was Jewish uh, and was uh, captured and put in a, a concentration camp. He ended up in Auschwitz, where the odds of survival is one in 28. So he didn't think he'd survive, and what he did to survive and write this book is a big part of the big idea in the book. Yeah. If you had to, because we're going to get into, there's really two main parts in this book. He breaks it down into, you know, his his some of his stories at camp, mm-hmm. and then he's he's a as you mentioned a uh, psychiatrist. What, a psychiatrist, psychiatrist, right? psychiatrist, yeah. So he talks about logotherapy and sort of the the branch that he created um, in the field. Um, but if you were going to give someone listening to this who's never read anything about it, like what? Mm-hmm. Why should they check this out? Why was it important to you? Well, I mean, I got, I got two phone calls today that might help you answer that question, and both were addiction-related. Um, one was from my friend Evan, who's an interventionist, and so he goes, he's the one who shows up and convinces people to go into rehab, and he says everything is up. Like People are not connecting um, a good future to this, this uh, current episode, yeah. and another one was a very similar. A good friend of mine had a, an incident with one of his, one of his kids, and, and uh, it's it's the meaning that they're attaching to a, you know, what some would say is a bad thing. And that's the big idea in the book. Like bad things are going to happen and you got to find the meaning in that for you and it's positive psychology. So what's the optimistic, you know, take on something. That's what I took from it. Yeah, no, exactly. So he, he calls it the existential vacuum, like mm-hmm. the the reason for depression, for suffering. It, mm-hmm. it, it's so substantial in today's age is because there's a lack of meaning. And so, for example, he's talking about unemployed folks. And he basically, you know, when they're his clients, he simply recommends, you know, go volunteer, go do something, create right. some type of temporary purpose. Right. And a lot of the times what you see is the, the depression dissipate and so we're going to connect the dots between his experience at just an out just an awful thing to, to read um and how he ties that to finding meaning in life the ultimate form of suffering um you know being deprived of food being beaten seeing your your peers you know die around you knowing that a gas chamber can await your, you know, the next day or the next week, right. or God forbid, being part of having to escort someone into there is unthinkable. And he assigned a very powerful meaning to his time in Auschwitz. And it was to write this particular kind of book. He wrote a few books and share his experience about how to find meaning in anything. Mm-hmm. And one of what he was most known for was uh, talking to people who were considering suicide because in Auschwitz, you couldn't stop someone from killing themselves. Right. They wouldn't let you cut the people down. That's what was written in the book. You had to watch them die. It Ugh. was another form of horrible punishment. So he would talk to people about, you know, they would they'd confide in him because he was a psychiatrist. Yeah. And they said, you know, I have, you know, there's no purpose in my life. And his famous positioning is perhaps life has a purpose that awaits you. Mm. out there somewhere there's something for you and for everyone and the book is about that journey to you know personalizing the suffering in a positive way and he attributed that to his life and the lives of others so like he was talking about because he had the idea the manuscript for for this but wasn't it this book or was it i'm not sure steve did he had a he had a book in his lapel when he got right and i think to, it was Logotherapy related. I was, it was, yeah, it was related to the to practice um, that that particular psychology he was working on and became basically logotherapy. Logos means, um, I think it means future, if I'm not mistaken. It means a couple of things, but I think it's the study of the, of the future. Right. Like what's out there. Um, and like that's what the psychology does. Right. So let me. It looks, the, looks forward instead of, you know, back, which a lot of psychology does now. And that ties into his his message right because like he didn't have that book his life work he had nothing but he started to slowly recreate it Mm. and he he says that's what kept me going like there was a point where he had typhus right and 
he thinks looking back now, if I didn't have that book, those little pieces, if I didn't feel like I had that bigger purpose, like I know that's what kept me alive. And he could literally look around and he would see when people lost that, lost that will, lost their sense of purpose or that the world had something for them. They'd pull out a cigarette. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't respond to being pushed or hit. And everyone would know that's yeah. that's it. Yeah, they'd saved a cigarette for when they got out. When someone pulled the cigarette out, they knew that was the end. Yeah, they'd, they'd watched them die over the next forty-eight hours. Um, yeah, so that's a really deep way to look at um, you know a really significant event that he survived. Yeah, you know the unthinkable, like as bad as it gets. And if you look and compare that by contrast to an event we may be going through, like our. Our grandparents fought a war and had to leave their families for two years, and we've been, you know, ordered to sit on the couch and watch TV and not go to the store. Mm -hmm. And you know, and everyone's assigning the, the most worst possible outcome to, like, it's a horrible thing. Yeah, it's not ideal, but what's the positive that you can get um, out of it? You know, and, and his his whole his whole teaching in logotherapy is you have a, a need and a responsibility. Um, if you break that word down, it means response able. Like you're programmed to look at the good in everything. Right. Your response is already programmed to say, well, what's good here versus, you know, what sucks? And you know, a lot of people, and you got to look in your social circles, I think, if you, yeah. you don't see many more optimistic people than us three. <laughs> so we're very optimistic. Right, right. But, you know, that's it. He says, he says to, well, I think he, he quotes Nietzsche like 50 million times in the book, but to, to live is to suffer. Um, or to be human is to suffer, to something is to find meaning in the suffering. Maybe to live is to find meaning in the suffering. Nietzsche. Very controversial. He had the, the uh, what's the quote that he, he had that I think at least five other people have kind of laid claim to? It's in this book. Yeah. Um, About a why. The one, the person with the why can endure almost, the person with the why can endure almost any how. Right. And you have so, a big enough why. Right. And right. we're realizing we're like, okay, so that's used here. That's used in Simon Sinek. That's essentially Steve, who are we talking about today? The good, good to great. Navy seal, uh, David Goggins, David Goggins. Yeah. Why? Um, I mean, why is everything? I mean, it's awesome how it showed up 75 years earlier in this book and was repackaged, uh, for businesses. Yeah. Repackaged for David Goggins is like, uh, you know, a, kind of a motivated book. And it's repackaged, and your, your content is all bit driven out, you know, break out of the suffering. Right. The Buddha says life is suffering. Right. That's, a, that's in Buddha's, um, the Buddha uh, belief is that no event is either good or bad. It is what it is, which is related to how you perceive the event. Right. Where you want to assign that to uh, a good thing or a bad thing. Like, it's up to you. Yeah, and you mentioned, like, people now suffering, you know, and then the hell people are going through. Well, you know, that's basically, and I meant to say this a second ago, and I forgot, like, that is the human condition that no matter how he uses the metaphor of gas, that no matter how big or small our suffering is, it'll consume our soul, it'll consume our life and our entirety. And then he says the challenge is rising up and, and making yourself, making something, finding purpose despite that suffering. Right. Um, so it's it's just i guess i guess what i find so incredible is how he says it's it's a necessary human condition suffering is not something that's um escapable but it's also not something you want to escape because it transforms your existence it's, it's otherwise you'd never do anything if you didn't have any controversy you'd have no story right all, all the things we talk about with story has to have some kind of some kind of conflict right um and, you know, man isn't alive to live a tension-free life. Like, you, if you have no tension on your muscles, they won't develop. If you don't push yourself as a runner, it won't happen. If you don't push yourself in business, it won't happen. If you don't play full out in love, it won't happen. Right. Not at any meaningful level. The suffering is the avenue to meaning. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. So it's the doorway and the road into what you want to make out of it. What it ends up meaning to you, you have a lot of control over that, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, I mean, they talk about that in the camp. Uh, mm. And so the reason, because it's such a dark thing, you know, right. but it's it's three-fourths of the book, you know, and he's talking about, like, the little things in life, the little things in the camp, like bread, like getting peas at the bottom of the soup. Like, they found joy in these little things, and it, it was possible for them, even in the darkest of moments, to find humor, to find art, you know, to sort of create that temporary happiness. 
um, you know, he says it's not the environment. It's the decisions you make. And you just feel like as a reader, <clears throat> if, if they can find joy and happiness in, in literally a hell on earth, mm. God, doesn't it, didn't it put things into perspective for you? It's like, All right. What was wild is he, you know, Alex Vesley is his grandson. Mm-hmm. And I talked to him this morning. He's in Vienna. He's going to join us on Wednesday for the author interview here. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. The closest thing we can get is his grandson, who also built a documentary called Victor and I. And it's about Victor Frankel, his life, and his contributions, and his person is really, really good. But some of it's actually in German. And, it, you know, I couldn't even read his subcatches, but I can tell that, that he lived a happy life. Like, he was not a guy that went into a concentration camp and was tortured. But he said this, which I thought was incredible, that essentially in the exit interview out of these camps, like years later, and I was like, what was it like? Mm-hmm. And what did it mean to you? For the survivors, a fair amount of them said, I forget the percentage, but a lot of them said it was a defining moment and it was a it was a strength building exercise. Like, you couldn't break me there, you'll break me nowhere. Right. And these were very powerful people for the rest of their lives. There's so many great stories about when you could survive that, anything's possible. I know. I know. He and says it's the one thing you have control over, right? The last of the human liberties is one's own assignment to the attitude they have towards an event. Mm-hmm. Like, that's free. Like, you can... You know, you can look at something and complain. You can look at something and say, here's the opportunity. You know, am I going to write a book? Am I going to write a speech? Am I going to get in shape? There's a lot of people marketing that stuff right now because the time presents itself, the opportunity to put a positive spin on something. There's things you can never do now that you'll never be able to do again. Yeah. Dinner with your kids, time, you know, 24 hours a day for a month with your family. That's pretty cool. Yeah. There's Din- always a positive. Dinner tables. You, we have dinner, right, Steve? That's right. <laughs> what was your takeaway? You eat Steve? all the food in this place. If you had to, like one one thing that uh, hit home for you, I'd probably say that it's, for me it reminded me of David Goggins, like I mentioned, where mm-hmm. uh, there's always the more you suffer, you can always do more, and by allowing yourself to see that suffering leads to that, and then plus just the crazy stories, those really stuck with me. Like like you said, the very scarce food, the frail people, the, the images he described, that's, it makes life now, like the hardship we have, similar to the way Can't Hurt Me made me feel, is if you can suffer and find meaning in those moments, then there's just, you, you should be able to find it now, and also that you shouldn't shy away from the suffering at all. That, I mean, it's a pretty common theme, but hmm. just those stories alone were just really impactful. Powerful. They definitely stuck with me. We're suckers for a good comeback, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody came back like this guy. God. I mean, nobody came back. He was, you know, right at the brink. It was amazing. And, uh, the, uh, remember the magazine story? I don't understand it fully. Say it again. I keep just having a hard time. Yeah. So this is, to me, like, it's just one of those things that, like, really hit home. It hit me, like, hit me to my core. So he's talking about, if I understood it correctly, uh, that after he got out, they took a picture of... Uh, some of the prisoners in camp looking down from a bunk as someone was walking into their hut, right? And so the outside world is now seeing this and they're looking at that and they're thinking, or they're saying to Victor at certain points in his, his life, like, oh my God, that's, you can see the fear in their eyes and you, like, it just, you can feel how terrible it is. And his thought as someone that was there was, why? You know, at that moment, that was the good stuff. We weren't, out there digging. We were, you know, warm comparatively. We had bread. Like that was a good portion of time. Yeah. And, and I, that almost broke me. Like it was just such a, a, an amazing sense of perspective that you can find, like it's the same thing we're talking about. If you can find the little joys in that hell, mm-hmm. you can do it anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what the social circles were all about because he said there was people that were kind of, some people were constantly, you know, thinking about the end, just like what happened in Good to Great. You know, those prisoners that thought they'd be home earlier died of a broken (laughs) heart. Big tie into that, yeah. Yeah, it's the same, basically the same concept. It is. And... Stockdale paradox. Right. And um, it's just a, you know, he has a metaphor about things in your life. Like that was seen to be a great time. They're probably being, you know, the deepest level of friends. 
but the movie the movie that plays throughout your life um i think this was from the documentary and not from the book but it, was, it is in the end oh it's, it, it is, is. okay yeah, yeah. yeah the movie uh of your life that if you're searching for meaning you haven't found it yet and you think like you're not where you need to be you're a failure or you're not being as successful as you should be the movie is a bunch of episodes the movie of your life is a bunch of independent episodes and they all have their own meaning at the time and you choose what you want to assign to that but the end in most movies a lot of good ones at least your real the real movie doesn't reveal itself until the very end of your journey right and that's the i think that's the essence of of uh searching for it you know searching for for purpose i guess and basically meaning is purpose you know why why are you there yeah, he said, um, and I'm, I'm going to look this up because I feel like it's super important, but he talks about how there is no right, there's no such thing as purpose. There's only like purpose in that moment in time. Do you remember that? Like you're supposed to find, that you don't, you're not looking for purpose, you find purpose in the moment. Like you don't have to go find purpose, you can find purpose within the moment. Yes. So it's asking that I think, again, I took these notes while I was running. So they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Asking the question, what is the meaning of life is like asking a chess player what the best move is. It's an impossible question. There is only what is the best for a specific moment in time. Mm -hmm. Best move for a specific moment in time. That's true. Um, yeah, because uh, it just made me think of all the changes I've made that you've made. Yeah, of you course. Know, you know, meaning chess is Chess is interesting like that. The math, the mathematical move may not be the real move because the, the computer will know where to move in chess. Yeah. It's, it always has a next best move on the board. Thing. It'll tell you that's the best move. And what I love about, about one, of the, one of the metaphors he has, he says it's the difference between the artist mm -hmm. and the optometrist. Like the artist paints a picture of the world and wants you to see it like that. The optometrist gives you glasses and helps you see your own world better. And that's what he, you're talking about his logotherapy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a, that's the whole, the connecting the dots to, you know, what is the best move? It depends on what you, what a win is. Yeah. Right. And so let's, let's make that connection, you know? So like the beginning, you know, we talked a lot about that, the mm -hmm. suffering, what they went through, what, how he defined it. And then he kind of moves on to his practice mm -hmm. and, pulls from a lot of experiences in the camp, but he uses that now to help people improve their lives. And so we're like Freud attributes, you know, uh, right. sex, sex and, yeah. uh, he uses meaning as the reason we feel the way we do. And as the, you know, leverage for changing our lives, transforming ourselves. So that's what it's about. Like he helps people look to the future and, and find value in themselves that way. Understand that, there's something out there for you. Right. Um, yeah, the, the, the whole concept of looking backwards versus, it's a, I'm sure this particular, in the 1950s, this was have been against the grain because they used to sit you down on a couch, right? And they'd say, you know, what happened? And, and now they'd sit you down on, on a, they wouldn't even sit you on a couch. They'd just say, picture the worst thing in the world that happens and what can you do with that in a good way? Mm -hmm. like if, so they, they're assuming that the bad thing is currently happening. There, there, was, there was some, you know, um, what's the paradoxical, paradoxical, what's the word? Intention. Paradoxical intention. You know, these, these things that you uh, think are going to happen that are bad, you make them happen. You know, the fear is the mother of, of the event. And so the, the, he has a technology that you... You, you like they had a, it was a story about a kid who was a stutterer and got caught stealing a ride on the bus and he wanted to teach the bus driver or tell the bus driver that he was a poor stuttering kid so he's trying to stutter in front of him and he couldn't stutter when he was trying to do it that All was right. kind of the concept between just try to do it um an kind of interesting concept the other concept that uh really impacted me the same way that uh you can suffer anything and this was like the most extreme example possible was the stockdale one of people that died because they thought maybe they get home by thanksgiving and then when thanksgiving come came and they didn't get out that was like their last hope it really reminded me of detachment like the universal law they talk about in all these different books even stoicism you've got to accept what you can't control especially like the date of your outcome right. and and with this book it again it, like a lot of times those stoicism type things of detaching from the outcome or not not being so uh, confined to a certain date something will happen you detach from it it's just a matter of 
uh, if you become upset or unhappy when it doesn't happen. So that way, because you can't control that or when it'll happen. But this was like the most extreme example of that with life or death. So I'm like, okay, this principle not only helps life and business and little decisions you make, like from the weekend, but all the way down to life or death, you you sit, you have to detach or else you're, you're, it's a matter of your life if you detach it to a certain date and it doesn't happen. It's pretty crazy. But those people. Well, you ever you ever trying to work out or something, and you got a number of reps in your mind, and well, you get there, you're done. Your brain's gonna quit on you. I right? had a lot of that with my training, is actually because I would have expectations, right. especially because I make videos on it. I'd go into the into the workout, and I'd, I'd have all these expectations, and mm-hmm. I've learned that recently, which is where I've made most of my progress. I have to go there and have fun, and really say it's okay if I don't do well because I tense up, and I've learned science mm-hmm. behind it too, which is even more fascinating. Yeah, you tense up. Did you ever try to run a little further? And not, you know, in, in your mind, you said, I'm going to run eight miles and you put it, put another half mile on the end. Oh, I always do that. Yeah. You do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a, that's, I guess a big deal because we, we, I caught a lot of baseball games and I, I never caught a no hitter. I, no, I never, I never, I never caught a no hitter. I don't think I ever, I caught hundreds of baseball games. Um, we had, you never had the pleasure of catching my curveball. We had a no hitter. <laughs> No, I mean a real, I mean a higher level ball. I think I might. <laughs> I, I like the stuff you guys play in the background there you of, go. in the house. Get him. Uh, the pitcher starts to tighten up as they get closer to that last out, and they're thinking in their head, "I hope this kid doesn't get a hit." Shit, it's the, it's exactly what happens. Like I've done, I've gone to the last out a couple times. I've gone many times actually, and boom, there's the hit. Yeah, there's the fear is the mother of the event. Uh, it's the same like juggling or trying to do something. You say, oh, if I can only get to 100. Once you get to 100, you drop the ball. Uh, no. You remember when Schilling was a, I think he was an out away from a no hitter and he called off Veritech and they got oh. a single up the middle. <laughs> I, for, I, I forget what year, but man. Uh, Veritech is the best. He is. He's the boss. Um, right at the beginning, he says um, not to make success a target. And the more you aim at success, the more you miss. And this book, funny enough, is an example of that uh, because he says, you know, coming out like he didn't want his name on it. He mm-hmm. felt like it was um, too, you know, egotistical. He wanted to be anonymous. Um, yet this is where he found his face. Um, you know, purpose and meaning were demonstrated through this. But it's almost like he couldn't escape it. It was the universe calling him. It's, it was his purpose. Right. Um, and... It's success that uh, you, you can't like, uh, he says, if you chase it too much, you'll miss it. Yeah. And it's when you release, I guess. And like a cat, you know, you ever hear that saying success is like a cat. You chase one around. It'll, it, you, you try it, go after it or avoid you. If you, if you avoid it, it'll jump in your lap. <laughs> uh, you never heard that? No. You ever have a cat? That's what they do. You, be, you try to get the cat to, to hang out with you. They'll go run into a closet and, and, and they'll never come out. But when you, Say so finally say forget that cat. <laughs> Two up. seconds later, boom, it'll be right in your lap. Yeah, it's really it's how cats are. It's very strange, but the success is um, is again going to the avenues of meaning. Like if you're not going down one of those avenues, and the three avenues he talks about in the book are um, a deed or or a job, mm-hmm. and the second one's an experience, like something that you've experienced. It doesn't have to be bad or person. Yeah, like you went across the Great Divide or you sailed across the ocean. Um, you know, and then the last one could be, you know, finding meaning and suffering. Mm-hmm. And it's when that's discovered, the suffering becomes no more. It's just a, an avenue to ultimately what you're going to do for meaning, which is oh, pretty powerful. When he says, when you identify the suffering, it goes away. It's, out, it's gone. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I mean, also on the previous point, right as a kid out of college, the, uh, she was the. COO at the company I work for, she would be like, Eddie, you're going to be teaching people. Like, you, you, mm. it's your thing. You're going to train people. Like, I want you to do that. You're good at it. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want to be, I want to be a manager. She's like, Eddie, that's not your strength. That's not your strength. I'm like, all right. I've, you know, ultimately, that's why I leave. And it's like, years later, what am I doing? It, it's just the most bizarre thing, you know, D- the, the way it came full circle like that. Well, I've seen, I've seen some interesting responses to things that you, you do these things like in 20,000 people or 30,000 people see it, you consider it a failure and like in videos, like you want a million because you, you, for whatever reason, but you get that one comment once in a while, pretty regularly where you've, you've affected someone's, someone's meaning in their lives. Like they saw your video at the same time and they've assigned that, you know, that good feeling to their, their own lives. And they, you know, averted, something horrible which we've seen in comments that you've had and we or they or they or they take taken a step in spite of uh the friction yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it's... Productivity tension. That's what Brian Moran called it last week. It's the productivity tension when, you know, you're pushing a little bit towards something good. It mm. gives, you a, gives you a little bit of tension, which is good, because you can start to search around, like, what does this mean? What does it mean when I don't feel good, or I feel, like, lost, or I'm alone? Right. That's all about stretching. Yeah. And finding that. It's a beautiful thing. What else... Uh, what else have we uh, I have a quote from Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle, actually, that was really, really sums up this whole book. That I, It's one of my favorite quotes that I read. I think it was from The New Earth. Remember when I read that, T? You let me you, borrow it. Was it about anger? You, you suggested I'd read it. What? <laughs> was she about? saying you really got to read that book? <laughs> no, no. That one was, this one was about like consciousness. But anyway, the quote from the book was, life will give you whatever wow. experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness. And it's, he also says, how do we know that this is true? Because this is the experience you are having at the moment. And it goes back to what we said the other day, which is uh, thought. You're, the moment's the only thing that really exists. Like there's no past, there's no future. Those are just actual thoughts. So it's weird when you combine the two of... Can you break the first part down for sure. me? Like I don't fully get it. Yeah, it's uh, life will give you whatever experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness. So... What I like about that is saying like that like whatever you're experiencing right now will help will be is always helping your consciousness evolve. Okay, it's it's a spiritual type of uh, it, it, concept. The, con- the consciousness is sort of it's the self essentially. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, like your awareness, like your ability to be aware in the world. So it helps you. It's raising that. So for example, if you have an encounter with somebody like we talked about chandelier or something, right? And that bothered you, and they really triggered you. If you that could be said that that's helping you evolve. Like you needed that in your life. Mm. But what I also like about that quote really a lot is that if you don't really believe that, if you choose to believe that, if you say, you know what, this might serve my consciousness, just like uh, uh, Victor says, then you go through life, the rest of your life with that lens. So like say you get in a car accident, you do chandelier, like, okay, this is going to serve my consciousness, not in the moment right now, but like if you go with that lens moving forward, then you could look back on that experience, just like you mentioned Mm -hmm. with all those people said it was a defining moment for them. And that's hopefully because they probably saw it as an evolution of them. But if not, then they'll be like, that was the worst, that was the worst. And then the rest of their life, they probably went downhill. So like everything's a lesson. Yes. Simply put, yeah. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) wow. I kind of came out in his uh, documentary. If you read this book, which I encourage, this is a short read. Alex Vesley has the document, Victor and I. He hired one of the one of the guards, one of the prison guards that was a psychiatrist <clears throat> in Germany, in Vienna. And they ended, he ended up, was very surprised that Victor Frankl would hire him because he was a prisoner. And he said, like, all people have have the, the need. It's about guilt. And mm-hmm. he talks about guilt with accountability. Um, and he connected that to prisoners when they're, when they're captured. Prisoners want to be held accountable. They don't want to be rehabbed. They'd rather just pay their dues and go back and, and then connect and find meaning in what they've done wrong instead of, uh, you know, uh, what's rehab? Like you're forgiven. Mm. Go back. And they want to find meaning in the event, which, uh, which I thought was interesting because re- re- addiction is <clears throat> also mentioned in this book in 1952, I think addiction, suicide, a lot of the same problems we're having now was always connected 90% of the time to it, not having a meaning, an identifiable purpose uh, or meaning. Uh, they're exchangeable a little bit. Uh, so everything's about that. Like, yeah. It's about deciding what you want to, what you don't want to be you know, in your life and then working towards something else, taking one of those avenues. I remember him talking <clears throat> about that, the, the addiction part, because he just touches on it briefly, right? Yeah. But he says it's like... Uh, the same thing as the uh, prisoners that we talked about that light up a cigarette yeah. and say, you know what? It's out of my hands. It's over. Yeah. And someone that constantly goes to substances, uh, it's the same exact type of existential vacuum, mm-hmm. that lack of meaning that, that p- would prevent someone from doing that to obtain something bigger. Totally. Totally. Um, <clears throat> I mean, they'll look at that, that, that transformation as a scene in their life. But many times when people come back from it, um, as addiction isn't, uh, you know, you could die from addiction, but it's far worse to be in living death, in my opinion, mm. that you don't have anything. You Will know, you like, explain that? Because that's, that's huge. <clears throat> yeah, the opposite of, um, I mean, Johan Harry did a TED talk. He said the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. It's, it's connection. The opposite. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. I don't need to laugh. It's funny. You, I, right? I just accidentally played a I heard it. I heard it on like three times the speed. <laughs> but uh, Johan Harry said the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. It's connection. 
like the addiction is loss of connection, which I think is meaning. You know, you're not wired into anything, so you're just kind of wandering around. And I think the opposite of uh, of life isn't death; it's uh, living death, which is addiction, a loss of connection, like completely on your own. It is living without meaning. Yeah. So these little ideas that you get, you know, when you read books or you listen to the right people, you got to be careful. Are you listening to the wrong artists, or do you have optometrists in your life? Is people helping you see better? Whatever you're programming yourself in. Is it helping you be better and see the things that are possible or is it people that are dragging you down? It's a beautiful question. I think it's number one. Well, we talk about that. Yeah, our, we did. In our lives did. earlier today. Yeah. I, 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 my thought on that is like, you know, especially if we're looking at this and saying you can take anything away, you can take a positive away from any situation. Like you'll always look at the light, your, the world through your lens. Um, but if you can look at the painter and mm-hmm. find pieces that fit into your story that help you, I think that's a sweet spot. I know it's a little bit of a pivot. There's some good pivot. There's a, you know, there's good paintings but, and there's bad, you know, people that paint bad pictures. Right. Look at the news. Or not even bad pictures, but pictures that aren't right for you. Right. They want to put on someone else's suit. Right. And instead they might say, oh, I like the way that suit fits. That's probably more like what you want to do rather than saying, I want to be like that person. Yeah. You see that a lot. Like people go away to seminars, these self-help gurus, and they come back starting to act and talk and dress like the person that did the seminar. Yeah. Like, oh, you, yeah, I always you say that. that like my mistakes in life are not from not doing work. <laughs> it's looking at someone else or something and saying, oh, that must be the right thing and, and pivoting and leaving my own track. My, right. right. Cause yeah, that's, there, there's just so much distraction and you can always go online and find ways to do things. It doesn't mean your way. <laughs> you get sucked in. Yeah. Man, that's, that's your brain's looking for answers. Your brain is subconscious, unconsciously looking for uh, fulfillment. You know, if you, if you're, as you're programming your brain with people that you hang around with and content you absorb, what do they call it? Consuming now. Mm. We consume content 10 hours a day, maybe more. What is it? And what's it contributing to? Not enough time reflection. Yeah. Right? Oh, that's so true. Yeah. So true. It's YouTube. I mean, it's like getting high on your own supply, working on YouTube. And every time you open it, it's like, here's the exact video you want to see at this point in time. You know how hard it is to not watch anything on YouTube? <laughs> Especially with the great copywriters doing the cognitive biases to you, you know, incredible transformation in 30 seconds. Right. That's a, uh, I'm so sick of seeing that crap. I know. There's one other line. I almost feel guilty about this because I'm bouncing all over the place, but there are things that I remember that I just were so powerful. Um, when he was talking about um, people like waking up from, so they, they leave the camp, right? They're freed. The allies come and they're not happy. They can't be happy. They can't get accustomed to this change. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says it's because they don't believe it. They can't make themselves believe it. They can't integrate into this new change. Mm. When people were sleeping, like every night they would dream about freedom and they would dream about food and they dream about their family. And every night they woke up every morning, they woke up to that sound and they were just disappointed. Right. And, yeah. uh, I don't even know what to make of that or what to do with mm. it, but it was one of those moments that just kind of rocked me. So I'm like, I want to make sure I talk about it a little bit. Did you talk to me about the, the guy that, I think it was you, Steve, the guy that puts the suit on every day, gets mm-hmm. in his car and yeah. goes to work every day and starts feeling like that's what he's supposed to be doing in life because it comes, they're conditioned, right? Right. They have the past experience. <clears throat> um, I was telling you too, Ed, with the neurons that kind of clusters up. But this is Joe Dispenza's stuff. And it's like you have these patterns that are carved of who you are because it's what you've already done. So your brain likes that known. And then every morning you wake up and then reinforce it with everything you do that's the same. So you brush your teeth, you put on the same clothes, you take the same route to work, you get to see the same people. And it reinforces those patterns. So it chemically in your brain just deeper and deeper. That's that's the tensionless life, right? Because you can easily do what you're doing. And I, I assume that's, um, you know, some form of meaninglessness. Yeah. Oh, dude. And I mean, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. It's, you know, it's nothing there. Nothing was harder for me than breaking that cycle. Nothing. The yeah. guilt that I felt, you know, like I told you, a, a yeah. year into my entrepreneurial journey, whatever you want to call it, that sounds a little cultish to say journey, but, mm. you know, as an entrepreneur, I would, I would be running 
at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday and just have this immense guilt like I should be somewhere else or I should be doing something else or that I wasn't doing the right thing because I just, yeah. You know what's cool, though? You still have that, by the way. Yeah, because Saturdays feel amazing still. But you, I mean, I know this for sure. I observe. You know, we, I see a lot. Like oh, you, this is going to be good. But, but you work, like you feel guilty if you're not working a little bit, I think. Yeah, it ruins every relationship in my life. But... <laughs> I know this 100% sure you know what you're doing is meaningful to you and that's going to be the way your, your mark will be close. Your movie's been revealed a little bit more than most people because you, you made a, a courageous decision. You cut away from something you knew wasn't going to be a long term. You had the wisdom of somehow or maybe you had enough pain or you had some kind of inspiration. That's the only two ways people change. They either are scared into doing it like in my case I almost died so I got scared and I made some changes or you get inspired which happens a lot less. Mm. or it happens over time you know you finally say enough's enough and you break away yeah so you have a new condition but you're 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 not your i'm an observation your your lust for being excellent will serve your meaning Mm. unless of course you're just not you know doing something you want to do but i know that's not true and by the way i really appreciate that same is true with the world's almost disciplined human being (laughs) (laughs) And Thursday night we we gave Steve the uh, best compliment in the world. Yeah, I know, but we we gotta <laughs> qualify that someday. He said easy on that stuff because you. It's funny because I. You're disciplined when you're jumping around I and think it's eating lettuce and stuff. But discipline with healthy <laughs> eating habits. Eating lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> discipline when it comes to healthy Shit lifestyle. Like, yeah, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not tasks. Tasks are tough for yeah. me to do. Um, discipline, like the same time, same thing. I'm yeah. very much with like the energy flow, but when it comes to healthy and getting things done, they all get done. Everything oh, gets done. We're conditioning you. We know yeah. that steak, like last <laughs> night was steak <laughs> night, and you were not included in steak night because <laughs> of your undisciplined behavior. Uh, well, I was. No, asking, that's good. I was good. Steve's, Steve's a, I was he's a star. Just stand up. <laughs> I, I was asking him yesterday, like, because in the 12 week year, you know, he <laughs> talks about falling back on your processes, yeah. and I was like, dude, like, because you, you, again, like, you have you've succeeded in a lot of it like you're again an admirable guy and you've done some great things but you are kind of sporadic with your approach and i was like well what is (laughs) what is your process to fall back on you know when you are walking by a pizza or like you know what makes you tick the so the food one became easy well let's think about that so the food one was when i learned about it it was i think it's learning where I had a really big experience with gluten, so-called gluten. I had knee pain for two years, tried every stretch in the book, tried every rehab, and I knew I wasn't going to take like a six-month hiatus from training. That just wasn't happening. So I accepted I wouldn't, uh, I would just have knee pain. And then I learned from a podcast actually that gluten could cause inflammation. People that cut it out of their diets have had a, a great success like with joint pain. So I tried it. I just cut it out. But big picture. Yeah. So wait, so... Like, yeah, big picture. I was like, I'm just going to try because I've heard a lot of things about the diet and the, it connects to your brain and all these different things. And I'm like, I'm not even worried about my diet yet. I'm trying to achieve these really high athletic goals and push myself and also perform. I was at corporate. I was uh, like, wor- I was doing YouTube at night, going to nine to five every day. So I'm like, I can't waste any, any ounce of energy. That's kind of where the energy thing started. And then when I... Uh, I cut out the glue and two weeks later I was stretching every day at the gym because I would like leave the gym and feel my knee hurting. Right. And so it would trigger me to stretch because when I would stretch it would help relieve it a little bit. Right. Then after two weeks I came for the gym like twice in a row. I'm like, wait, I forgot to stretch. And I would notice, I'm like, wait, I don't even have pain. That's why I didn't have like the cue to stretch. And the only variable that changed was the diet. Haven't had it since. Um, and I was like, wow, that's a huge shift from like two to three years of constant pain to two weeks of it completely eradicating was a huge eye opener me to, for me for diet. Um, and so, go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to say, if you're talking about from this book, would you say it was more reactive or would you say you are, as Franco would say, like, like looking into the future at your purpose and you take a second and you say, this doesn't help me where I want to go. So it also aligns with who I was becoming because right before I got to my corporate job in through college, I was cutting away people, sports, all these different things because I had an awareness, luckily, of like, I want to 
be myself. And I didn't, I struggled with that for years through high school. And then the beginning of college, I was like, not myself, myself. I was really confused for a while. So then when I finally cut away and started being myself, found myself happier, started doing more things of what I liked instead of what other people wanted, the diet and the healthy lifestyle also aligned with that. Um, so I found the purpose of like, this is just another factor to be more myself, which my ultimate purpose was to maximize everything I can do. I was in my corporate job. I wanted to escape. I wanted to give myself the best opportunity I possibly could. So I believe it was just the purpose of like, you know what? This is like a huge goal of mine. The dunking was a huge goal. I had been making videos for years already. And it like I had a big uh, external force too that would like live up to my expectations of what I put on the internet. But also I would question, do I even want to do it? And all these purpose things. So I mm. think it was really connected to my high goals of leaving corporate and achieving like athletic goals. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the big idea is there's a something waiting out there for everyone. And life's about pursuing something yeah. that allows you to give the most fully version of you to the world. You know, a kind of a mission or a purpose or a meaning, whatever it is, and being aware of it. Yeah. So for Steve, it was athletic goals, you know, being able to communicate through that. What would you say it is for you? And we kind of talk about this with, with I like like to, getting to why, but yeah, I mean, there's, I like the, the concept of, of, uh, I mean, my, my whole program in Ted dog was about recreating yourself, which is bringing something new into existence at a later date. Mm -hmm. It's kind of logotherapy. And you know, my, my journey came out of suffering. It came out of being terminally ill and I went through a lot of painful experiences and sad experiences for everyone. Mostly, you know, the way I've, you know, I was dying, but other people had to watch me die, which is harder. Instead of like, you know, it was an addiction-related suffering, you know, alcoholic liver failure is caused by too much alcohol, kills your liver. And the addiction industry wanted me to, you know, self-identify as being addicted and being an addict forever and rehabilitating me backwards. Um, by the way, you said that so beautifully, plainly earlier. They wanted you to look backwards. You wanted yeah, to look it's the forward. Same, it's logotherapy. Yeah. Yeah, like like rehabilitation is about restoring something back to the, another condition, a former condition that for whatever what it was, it produced the result that wasn't a good result. It was terminal illness. Recreating is bringing something new into it. And the first, you know, one part of it is about, you know, vision, visualizing what that might look like. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one, what I did is I gave myself a reputation to live up to so that I behave that way. And that gave me meaning and then teaching others to, you know, particularly when they're, they're highly ambitious, but they're also in a place where they need to change. I like that particular client. That's awesome. Because they're, they're inspired. I mean, they're, they're inspired and motivated and they got a little pain. That's a good, good start, good place to start. You? I, oh, sorry. I what about question, yourself? Actually. Um, I actually I I was thinking about it today. So there's a lot of ways to kind of say it, but I think the way that really resonates is um, creating and storytelling in a way that's meaningful to me, so that I personally am satisfied and have an outlet, but that also means something to other people, so that they have value, and so like and God, this is really coming together. So it's almost like I want to be a painter and an optometrist. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I want to create things that fulfill my sense of, I don't even know what to call it. That's kind of uh, cool. Uh, Self-expression. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Self-expression, but also create, create it in a way that allows other people to look at it, understand it and utilize it in a way that however it's best for them, whatever mm -hmm. they're going through. Um, I gotta, I gotta figure out a way to polish that, but I that's it. Like, I mean, I have the same exact ambitions and I feel like if people get to their core of who they really are, it, it gets very similar to those two things of self-expression and helping others. It, a, it comes down to that a lot. Yeah. And a lot of things I read and people I talk to. Wow. Maybe it is that simple. Yeah. Express yourself and help others. Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're, I mean, you're getting the feedback. I mean, I don't know exactly how you paid. I still, I don't think I ever will. You know, through YouTube, it's just like it's a very like a black hole to me. Yeah, but enough people see things and connect with your message that they keep coming back. So you're you're giving them medicine, and in doing so, you're being fed. You know your 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 purpose. I mean, you're you're being you're given the feedback, right? Because uh, you know you know ultimately you want to you want to help people and you want to have uh, you know a good way to survive pro survival reward, which is money in our world, so we can pay for things, and then you want to have ultimately some kind of time for freedom to continue the cycle of, of, um, 
of inventing things and creating things. Yeah, exactly. And the, by the way, that's the self-expression is what carried me through before I got the feedback, as I'm sure you guys right. both dealt with oh, in yeah. some regard, you know, because feedback's not always there. That's, and that's yeah. You die of a broken heart if you think it's going to happen in a year. Exactly. We're only six months into this, and we, we just did a, uh, a 12-week year plan today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to stand where you are and feel good about anything unless you do a, a lot of looking back, right, you know, where you came from and, and, and getting visualize, you know, visualizing what, what we want. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had a really productive meeting today about things we're going to implement to contribute because the, the, the base of this particular investment of time for Eddie and I and Steve is uh, we want to read books so we can share the knowledge. We can curate books. There's millions of books. We want to curate it down to ones that can help people. And we, we like all working with entrepreneurs. Right. God, it's amazing. Like we, that is the why. We know yeah. the why. And then the how is kind of what we tinker with. It's yeah. like how, where is the sweet spot with entertainment and education? Because you can't have just education. You can't have just entertainment. Right. For what we want to do, and and we'll find it. One and we are finding. We, yeah, it. one thing we were just going to say. We just found a really unique way to do it, which is the video we collaborated on, oh, which yeah. is a really cool. Uh, we did the twelve week year by Brian Moran. Eddie used his. Spe- uh, sp- what do you call it? Uh, I was going to say speech writing, but I was, I was yeah, that's for a better word. Speech writing and vocals, and I did the editing of the video, and it came together. Just it was just awesome teamwork, and just made the video this something you could feel from the book. So instead of just a book summary, it's like a ride that you go on. A yeah. book trailer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. There, I don't think one exists. You don't ever see the that's, video book trailer. That was the trailer. coolest part. We yeah. felt so excited. Well, we'll see how Brian, Brian's going to be the first one that's going to experience this. So if you're listening, Brian, which I hope you are, listen to the book trailer we did for the 12-week year. That's a why. Yeah. This is why you want to learn this system. And why you want to take this book in, I mean, if you can't come up with a couple ideas about how to how to get a more intentional process in your life to to find that avenue of meaning, uh, you know, through an experience, through a deed or a job or through a, a suffering that you're currently going through. Um, I promise you, you'll find it. Yeah, a hundred percent. This book brings you perspective that is just hard to find anywhere else. I'm super excited about interviewing his grandson, Alex. I got a quick question from Parker, actually. It says, how can we find meaning in the monotonous task that business sometimes requires? Meaning in the monotonous task. So maybe like how this book can apply mm. to monotonous day-to-day tasks that you might find in business, kind of tying it back to business. I, I, my, my gut, and, and feel free to jump in. I mean, my gut goes to the, you know, the, the Ryan Holiday purpose versus passion. Mm. You know, when you have purpose, when you, when, you know, something's truly meaningful to you, the idea is you're going, it's, it's implying that you're going to have down days. It's implying that there's going to be monotony. Mm-hmm. But you're just kind of signing the, the the dotted line to go through those ups and those downs for something better. Whereas passion or that quick blast of dopamine, the people that only have that, they don't do the monotony. <coughs> Choking. <laughs> um. <coughs> my, my um, I'll bail you out. <laughs> Thank you. Because in in selling, like I'm gonna assume monotony, like the best thing that a financial advisor did and they always enjoy it. It's like, I love meeting with clients. It was, it's amazing. It's so much fun. What they don't like doing, referrals. making phone calls, asking people for referrals, uh, coming back six times before someone can make a decision. Uh, all of that's not, or making new proposals, office work. It's all, it's all very, very, or having lunch and smooching. All that's really important. And none of it would allow the <clears throat> client or the agent to advisor to sit with a client if they didn't do it. So the monotony of the task, my first coaching would be if it can, if you can find meaning in your work and not do it, eliminate it because a lot of times you can, or assign a an accrued value to the current activity. And it's called a leading and lagging indicator, like we did it last week. The leading indicator could be phone calls, like give yourself a point for the phone call and start start connecting a good day to an amount of points because you're not going to get paid for that phone call until months later. Yeah. And then, you know, for a creator, like you're you bang out hours and hours of a video and nothing like you're just getting action from a, a video we did in New Year's. Yeah. It's May. Right. You couldn't feel real good about it while you're editing video into the night, right? You have to yeah, it's, it's you got to figure out that that you got to trust your systems, right? This kind of these books kind of blend into each other. It's not interesting. 
like the operating system was the book we did last week for your meaning. Like you can build a build a journey and build a series of movies and scenes that can create your 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 life's journey that reveals itself at the end. Hmm. Keep looking. All right. Well, you want to hit him with next week's book? Sweet. Well, how are you? I'll do it. Uh, next week we have Drive by Daniel Pink. Um, do you know? I don't know much about this. I'm excited to read it. It's, it's um, gonna, you're going to love this book. If you didn't, I already read it. It's Motivation 3.0. Daniel Pink oh, yeah? is a you know a lot of the science of of getting things done and influence and, and uh, what motivates people. This is a, a great book. Um, if you're ever selling or managing people or trying to just influence people, um, you see a lot of the the concept of flow in here. Mm. Mihail Chick sent me high's book about flow. Finding flow in everyday uh, work, which kind of will get you, you know, um, into a better place. Because remember, what flow is, it just kind of flows. Time doesn't go by. Like, we love doing this. Is it an hour yet? Maybe close? Close, I yeah. didn't, didn't, didn't notice it at all. Right. I love doing this. I well, learned, maybe. I taught, I connected, and I've created a legacy of uh, content that others can learn from long after my life. It's a beautiful thing. So would you say that this is more practical, like more application, whereas this week's is maybe more theory? Yeah, nothing's going to get more more deep than that. Uh, yeah, this is a book you're going you're gonna to learn some, some strategies. You're going to make some distinctions. This guy's a – by the way, he's doing an interview with us too. So we're getting authors to come on. Um, you can actually ask him that directly. Yeah, but you'll see both. Cool. Right. I'm going to reread it too. Join us Thursday. Sweet. All right, guys. All right. Bye. Bye.